Hi. Oh. Okay, so first a disclaimer. Uh, this talk was sponsored and written by 100% ethically sourced human brain meat. It's furnished by yours truly. No content was knowingly furnished or by the product of an AI or ML system. Uh, all logos and trademarks are copyright the respective owners. And uh, while my uh, employer has graciously sponsored my attendance, this work is an entirely self-indulgent exercise that reflects my own lack of personal taste. Uh, this is to say that the views and opinions expressed in the following presentation are my own and any resemblance to those held by past, current, future, alternate timeline versions of my employers, affiliated institutions, spouses, or flatmates is entirely coincidental. And finally, I'm not a lawyer. Please do not construe anything in this talk as legal advice. Do your own research, as I have done mine. Walk slowly and carry a big stick. So first question, what is vidOS? Well, from the README, we learn that vidOS is a complete, single-purpose Linux system that just plays videos. More precisely, it is a bunch of pre-built components and a utility to assemble those components into little Linux distros that just boot and play your specified videos. Nothing more, nothing less. Like literally, Vobu, that's vidOS build utility for short, dash V and a path to a video file that will generate an OS image you can stick onto a thumb drive, plug into a laptop, boot up, and play your video. Okay, why? This seems pretty silly. Well, it was 2020, and for some reason, caustic levels of boredom forced the complete idea fully formed into my head of a prank, whereby your buddy boots up their PC and it immediately starts playing Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. I guess the idea didn't totally come out of nowhere. I'd been monkeying around with embedded Linux stuff for a while now. And so as a proof of concept, I whipped up something in Buildroot. I don't remember exactly what I did. I think I basically took the PC x86-64 def config, turned a few things on, and the result was a pretty standard FAT32 slash ext4 disk image that was several hundred megabytes in size. It worked, but it left me wanting, wanting more. You see, I didn't really know what I wanted, but like any good personal project, I had a few goal posts I could no doubt move so as needed to stave off my boredom. I wanted to support the newest, most awesomest web video codecs, or at least the ones supported by uh, the big red play button. Uh, for security purposes, and because I'm a total killjoy, I wanted it to be read-only, or at least have all the moving pieces be read-only so that no one can do anything naughty with it. It's one thing to be a harmless prank. It's another to be an infection vector. And obviously with the read-only bit, I still wanted to be easy to arbitrarily yeet in videos. So this wasn't a one and done. I needed a system, a system that was stupid simple, stupid small, and stupid easy to use. And I didn't want any super weird tools. No, no dependencies, no tool chains, no make files, no elevated privileges, no nothing. And no compiling. Just because we're making whole Linux distros from scratch, kind of, uh, doesn't mean the end user should have to compile anything. So in summary, it's gotta be multi-format, easy to use and deploy, Secure, not clever enough to be dangerous, and small. I mean, this is just friggin' helpful for a lot of reasons. So in summary, that's M-E-S-S, -S or mess. So let's begin. All right, so in any discussion of embedded Linux, I think the most important place to start is at the end. Oh, sorry, that's a little bit broken. Yes, that's right, the end. So if we take a look at this, this is vidOS right here. This is an init script that launches MPV, which is a video player. Uh, so if you download, any distribution, uh, you install it, you download all the necessary packages, you drop this init script into whatever dark recess on your system init scripts are supposed to live, uh, you're ready to go. It'll boot up, it'll play your video. That's, that's it, uh, really, seriously, that's it. Um, there's a few issues with this though, Most, uh, mostly the fact that then you have to download, install, and configure an entire Linux system. Uh, this is fun, once. Uh, you have a bit of a hard head start if you already have a Linux system set up, uh, but if you're doing it from scratch, boy howdy, you have the whole world ahead of you, and Godspeed if you're doing it on an older machine. Modern distros uh, demand more system resources just to function, and running the installer can take forever. So uh, best case, you can probably get everything set up and running within an hour. Worst case, you've tried you know, a bunch of different distros, drank, I don't know, maybe like seven cups of coffee, uh, given up and bought a Raspberry Pi, and now you have to get the video playback working, depending on how or when or why or whatever during the boot process that you want the video to play. Uh, you might have to kill your X11 session or do an auto login or add an extra user or do more scripting, and this is a lot like trying to jury rig a car to drive by itself. It's something that was really designed to be operated by a human, 
So instead of all that, I decided to automate by spending three years uh, building a robot arm to build me arbitrarily sized skateboards. And the cool thing about skateboards is skateboards roll by themselves. OK, now that we're done with the end, we can start with the beginning. Or I guess the VidOS components directory, which is what will become our final distribution. Now a distro is a kernel and a root file system. And because the kernel is the core of any distribution, we're going to start there. You can think of the kernel like a big program in charge of all the drivers and general infrastructure that we need to run programs on a computer. And here we can cover the S's. Uh, and the best part is that we get to compile our own Linux kernel. Yay! All right, so this is the Linux make menu config kernel thingy. Uh, it's where you configure all the options for the kernel. Uh, I've loaded it with the default kernel configuration for x86-64 PCs. What you do is you use the arrow keys or the scroll wheel to select things in space or Y to turn things on and off. And so for starters, what we're going to do is we're going to find these options and other similar options, which are turned on, and we're going to turn them off. Because think about it. We don't need networking to play videos locally, and it's a vector for attackers. We don't need keyboard support because we don't need a keyboard to play videos. That's what the init script is for, and it's a vector for attackers. And we don't even need to communicate with our system to play videos, so we'll disable that because it's a vector for attackers. And that's basically the major work we're going to do on the kernel for security. I mean, we do other stuff, too, to like make it smaller. But this is, this is the most important part. Another way to think about this that's our kernel. Now, obviously, we're only going to do this on the production system. We're not going to do this on the development kernel, because obviously we need to interact with our machine. Um, what we do need in our production kernel, eh, high level, it's like drivers for stuff. You know, we need drivers for sound, and we need a way to display video to the screen. And, and, and being able to like, use some GPU stuff would be nice to help with the video part. Um, so at the end of it, our kernel is 14 megabytes, approximately. Now time for the root file system. A root file system, for our purposes, is folders on a disk that contains libraries, files, and applications that actually constitute the whole operating system. Uh, we build our root file system with build root, which is sort of like Linux's make menu config thing, but for building entire Linux distributions. And we basically just turn everything off, except for core system utilities and a video player. So, so this is what our, our root file system looks like at the end. And, and you can see it's mostly empty because it's just the video player and some core system utilities. And normally what you do is you'd put this on some kind of disk somewhere, like in our case, a USB stick. Uh, and then when you boot, you tell the bootloader to tell the kernel where to find the root file system. And it mounts the root file system at boot. But if you've ever tried running a Linux distribution off of a USB stick, you know that this kind of sucks. Because running an OS requires lots of little reads and writes to the disk. And USB sticks have terrible random access performance. And if you're not careful, you might even like wear out the flash chips on the thumb drive. But you know what does have great random access performance and almost infinite write endurance? RAM. OK, so stay, stay with me here. So way, way back in the 2.6 era, kernel developers realized that mounting the root file system could be a gigantic pain in the butt. And so it would make things easier if we had a bunch of user space tools available to help mount the root file system. And so what we did was we created an entire extra root file system whose sole purpose is to help us mount the real root file system. It's a, CPIO, it's a CPIO archive, which is like a tar archive, but different. Uh, and it's called the innate RAMFS, which of course stands for the initial RAM file system. And you don't have to use it. And so sometimes it's empty or, or null or whatever. But it's always technically there. And guess what? So let's put our stuff in there. So first, we're going to create the CPIO archive by descending into the root file system directory and, and doing that. Seriously, you have to do exactly that. I'm not making this up. Uh, it's going to be 18 megs. Boom. We're going to compress it. Boom, 8.7 megs. And then with this flag in the kernel config, we're going to specify a path to it. Boom, it's in our kernel now. The full name for this combo is a unified kernel image, or UKI for short. And this is basically our whole operating system rolled up into a burrito. But hold up, you say. That's super cool. But now the root file system is inside of the kernel. Doesn't our video have to go in the root file system? Yes, it does. You're right. I mean, the goose has been stuffed and the donut has been jellied. And while you can shuck a Linux kernel to uh, reveal its delicious buttery insides, it's the classic golden goose problem. You can't really put the goose back together again. 
So in the beginning, I struggled with this for a little bit, trying to figure out what to do. But then I remembered something from the init RAMFS documentation. You can have more than one init RAMFS. And anything you add gets smushed together into the final fi root file system. So what we're going to do is we're going to make another init RAMFS with just our video in the directory we want it to live in the final root file system. We're going to create another CPIO archive. We're going to compress it. And then we're going to tell the bootloader to pass it along to the kernel with the init RD argument. OK, so now we know how to sneak our video past the temple guards. Now we've got to figure out what kind of videos we want to support. And I mean, I have many opinions about video formats and the encoders and decoders that make them. But if we wish to dine at, um, let's, let's say, uh, Café La Bouton Rouge, my apologies to those French speakers in the audience, then for tonight's menu, we have three classics. We have the dry-aged AV1, pan-seared and topped with fresh Opus audio for the discerning palate. We have a smoked WebM with wild-caught and garnished with capers and dried Opus on the side. And the AVC burger uh, comes with bacon, a slice of highly processed bright yellow AAC audio, and no pickles. Boy, howdy, it's, it's a video. The good news is that the video player we're using, which is MPV, uses FFmpeg, a command line multimedia editor, or rather FFmpeg's libraries. And FFmpeg supports all of those video formats. So this is, this is no big deal. We just build a plain Jane regular copy of FFmpeg, right? OK, let's try this experiment. We will attempt to download and build a vanilla normal copy of FFmpeg. So, so nothing extra turned on. We're just going to do shared libraries. OK, and we're going to look at the size of our total libraries. And, and it's 99 megabytes. Uh, we didn't do this, obviously, because otherwise our entire root file system would have been over 100 megabytes. FFmpeg is great because it supports everything. But that also makes it huge. And, and most people, to be fair, don't even build FFmpeg this way. They add extra guacamole. This is the FFmpeg config from Debian 12. Look at how much extra stuff you can add for an even bigger result. OK, that's a normal distribution. So, so what happens if we have build root build us a normal grass-fed FFmpeg? Well, it uses this config, which looks even more horrifying. But what it's actually doing is it's explicitly turning things off, and the sizes are way, way better. Again, run the totals. OK, only 19 megs now. This is still too big, but it's closer. How, what did we do to make it smaller? Well, it, it's really simple. We, we just drop support for all but one kind of video in our OS. Our, own, our OS can only support one kind of video, which is why we're going to make three of them. So that's one video format per UKI. And because FFmpeg already has a built-in WebM decoder, we're going to start with that one. Uh, so first, what we're going to do is we're going to turn everything off. Uh, we're going to enable support for the two video codecs that go inside of a WebM, which is a VP8, VP9, and Opus, which is our audio codec. We're going to enable parsers for the same. We're going to enable a uh, demuxer for Matroska. WebM, the WebM container is a derivative of Matroska. And then this is, this is super important. Video files are, are files. So we need to enable support for files. This is super important. And then uh, out devices, frame buffer device, that's the, the display, and also an OSS, that's audio. OK, run the totals again. Hot dang, 3.3 megs. OK, moving. Oh. OK, so, so what happened is that basically Google bought a company called ON2 that made video codecs. And they released a codec they've been working on uh, called VP8 under an open license. And, and that's, that's, the, that's part of the WebM video format. And, and well, well, here's a quote from Larry Horn, the CEO of MPEG LA, which is a patent pool, saying in a very roundabout way how they are going to start a patent pool for WebM. Uh, it, it actually gets a little bit worse. Uh, supposedly, some feds actually started look, investigating MPEG LA for antitrust practices because of them trying to limit the flow of WebM as a standard. Uh, the good news is that this was a few years ago. And uh, they were both able to kiss and make up and settle their differences with minimal court intervention. OK, so on to AV1. Uh, it's a little bit more tricky. We're going to have to go in and select the DAV1D package under target libraries, target packages, libraries, multimedia in builder's menu config, which sets this flag. And then, I mean, it's the same thing. Just, you know, instead of VP8, VP9, it's libdavid and, and AV1, basically. You know, and oh. OK, so uh, AOM is the Alliance for Open Media. They're the consortium thingy behind AV1. And Sysvel is a patent pool administrator. And, and actually, there's another patent pool administrator for AV1. This one got started in, in, in 2023. And, and AOM actually made a statement in 2020 to nobody in particular that they were not 
frightened of this, stating, uh, AO Media is aware of the recent third-party announcement attempting to launch a joint patent licensing program for AV1. AO Media was founded to leave behind the very environment that this announcement endorses, one whose high patent royalty requirements and licensing uncertainty limit the potential of free and open online video technology. And to be honest, there have been some fair criticisms about the validity of some of these uh, essential patents. Um, here's another one. This one actually got revoked. And look, to be honest, I'm not scared. AV1 is very clearly the future. Every single video on this website that is 4K or above is only available as a WebM or AV1. And Twitch is breaking the 4K live streaming barrier with AV1 as we speak. So this is clearly the future. We're going to move on. All right, last stop, lads, plads, and bromeliads. AVC, which of course stands for Advanced Video Coding, also known as H.264, which is defined in MPEG-4 Part 10. Do not confuse this with the video codec defined in MPEG-4 Part 2 Visual, because it is entirely different. This is important, because MPEG-4 Part 2 Visual can sometimes be referred to as MPEG-4 Video, or MPEG-4 ASP, or sometimes as DivX, which is the name of a codec for it, which should be in no way confused with the now defunct video rental service from Circuit City called DivX, even though it is named after it. And in fact, both of these codecs can be contained by MPEG-4 Part 14, which is the actual MP4 container, you know, that thing. Uh, and of course, those files can also contain MPEG-4 Part 3, Subpart 4, uh, I I'm sorry, I, I meant uh, AAC, uh, the audio codec, which of course stands for Advanced Audio Coding, and, and I'm, I'm stalling because we can't. We can't support this. There's just no way. I mean, FFmpeg has really good built-in decoders for both of these things, but, but everything is covered in a thick layer of patents. Uh, AVC is fully swaddled by MPEG-LA. Uh, AAC is, is fully covered by, by VIA licensing. Oh. Yeah, VIA licensing are, and MPEG-LA are now two great tastes that taste great together. Uh, they join forces. Um, so the long and short of it, and I mean very short, is that our best guess for H.264 patent expiry is sometime in 2027. And I don't even want to think about AAC. Uh, go check out this article. It's, it's great. It's not written by a lawyer, but it was fantastically done for more information about that. Uh, now there's some interesting carve-outs here. Per this document from 2022, you have to pay MPEG-LA for every encoder, decoder, or codec, which is both, you mint. Uh, and for video that you make for payment. But if there's a specific carve-out for video that is distributed for free over the internet which is why you can find it on uh, the, the Big Red website. Uh, AAC is a similar game-ish. Uh, you only got to pay them per codec that you mint, uh, but not for the audio you distribute, even if you sell it. As for pricing, AVC is like 10 cents a unit up to a cap of a couple million dollars. You hit that cap, you don't have to pay them any more money. Of course, every five years they renegotiate the licensing terms, and every five years that cap has gone up. As for AAC, the price seems to start at about a dollar and decrease with volume down to 10 cents. Uh, whatever happens, though, you've got to enter a contract and then do lots of accounting and then pay them out quarterly. And suffice to say, I'm not a big fan of paperwork, and I'm an even smaller fan of large organizations of lawyers. So it's, it's quite settled. I cannot ship decoders for H.264 and AAC out of the box. Full stop. So let's try getting out of the box. You see, another big prong of web video is video conferencing, something I'm sure we've all known to grow and know and love over the past four years. And, and there's this little company called, um, that ships so many software H.264 codecs in their conference boxes, they hit this cap every single year. And because they're such cool dudes, they not only open source their H.264 codec, here's the GitHub, they hand out pre-cooked binaries. And the pre-cooked ones are free because Cisco compiled them and already gave MPEG-LA millions of dollars. Now Cisco could turn around and charge us, but in their own words, they won't because they're being bros. As for AAC, well, guess what? Fraunhofer open sourced their AAC codec for Android. Here's the info. Here's the source. Uh, then someone took it and spatchcocked it so it could be used on more generic Linux. And then some folks over in Fedora land, Tom, you know where you are, uh, took a real good hard look at the patents and were like, you know, it sure looks like all the stuff touching AAC LC decoding, that's AAC low complexity, is free and clear. And so they deboned it to create FDK AAC free, which is available, which contains only the AAC LC decoder and is available in frozen nugget form at your local Fedora repo mirror. Okay, well, I guess there are some binary packages available, but how are we going to get them in the root file system? You know, the one that's already like shrink wrapped? Here's a hint. 
second verse, same as the first. We're going to add libopenh264. We're going to add fdkaac to build root as source packages. We're going to build ffmpeg against them. And then we're going to delete them before we add them to the root file system, before we build the UKI and ship that to the end user. And then the end user can agree to the patent licenses and download the binary copies of the library and put them into the external init ramfs. All right, so that's the kernel in the video sorted. Now we need to put it in some kind of outer file system that the BIOS or firmware can find and boot from. I know. Well, hey, let's use the ISO 9660 file system. It's a read-only file system. Uh, you know, it was this cool spec developed from the High Sierra format, uh, which is, of course, named after the High Sierra group, which is named after the uh, Dell Webb's High Sierra Casino and Hotel, where the group of companies met up to author the specification. And, of course, we'll also need to make it bootable. Uh, so we'll need to use the El Torito extension, which is, of course, named after the Mexican restaurant where the two original authors developed it. For the record, I am not making any of this up. And now, through the magic of a hybrid MBR, we can make this file system bootable not only from block devices like USB drives and hard drives, but from highly sophisticated, optically read worm media like the compact disk. All right, we did all that by hand. Now we've got to make it easy. We've got to make some sort of program or utility to do all the work for us. I'm thinking we write it in some sort of high-level modern scripting language with, with, with good library support. That's right, JavaScript. But then we'd still need to pick an external interpreter, and package management can be a pain with NPM. So let's use Bash instead. I'm sure this is a great idea that won't make our lives super difficult and frustrating. All right, so in the very beginning, I wrote a simple script called probe sh, which would take a path to a video file as an argument, and if it passed some tests, would push it into the final image. This was extended and finally subdivided into vobu sh and the corresponding config files that live in nested directories inside of the vidOS components directory. I'm not going to drag you through every little corner and feature the Vobu script. That's what the README is for. But I will drag you kicking and screaming through the fundamentals. So what happens is you pass Vobu an argument to a video file, or files, or a directory of files. The all-powerful pick codec function is pass the name of the video, and if the codec hasn't already been specifically set, runs ffprobe to determine the video's encoding, which is then mapped via Bash's associative array functionality to a video format. We do this because the web informant supports both VP8 and VP9 video, and we need to resolve both to WebM. Uh, we can then reuse this information uh, to actually help us pick the correct kernel that we need. Uh, once this is set, CheckVid comes along and checks the videos to see if they're the specified format. Uh, if they are, uh, and then they, it puts them in the init ramifes. And we, we do some fun stuff to generate a playlist. And, and that's basically the real magic. The other functions of VidOS devolve into either downloading stuff, unpacking it, and putting it into the external init ramifest, or moving stuff from the VidOS components directory to, into the external init ramifest, or moving stuff from the VidOS components directory into what will become the final root file system. Um, the slightly neat bit, though, is that the Vobu script really just contains the option parsing and video collection logic. Uh, in order to support future architectures, as planned, we need to do different stuff to actually load different functions into the Vobu script using the config files in each architecture directory, that, that text file called config right there. So this is what the handle firmware function for x86-64 looks like, which handles downloading binary firmware blobs for GPU support. And this is the function install ext libs, which pulls down lib fdk aac free and open h264. So as you can see, bash is the E that really turns this into a mess. And laugh as much as you want, but those are our only dependencies, because Bash lets us lean so heavily on the Unix philosophy. All right, end game. So this is everything that XRISO takes and bakes into our ISO 9660 file system. It's, you know, 23 megs, plus the size of our video, basically. Bootloader's in there, a couple of other things. But just one more thing. I'm going to answer this question for real this time, I promise. But I'm going to start by stating for the record, this is not a new idea. Movix slash eMovix was a project from the early 2000s that assembled a lightweight distro for multimedia playback using Slackware and mPlayer. I learned about this like a year into my development of VidOS. Cathode Ray Dude has a whole series of videos about PCs from the early 2000s that could dual boot other tiny OSs for stuff like office tasks and quick multimedia playback. Heck, in 1965, there were two different brands of 16 millimeter film based video jukeboxes that were installed in cocktail bars, both in America and in France. And now, digital signage is everywhere, today. 
And we do it with stuff like this digital signage player that's hundreds of dollars. But you know what we could also do? You could rescue a thin client from a landfill on eBay for 30, maybe 40 bucks, and just type vobu dash v in the path to a video file. In no particular order, I would like to thank uh, Rob Landley for his documentation on the Linux init Ramifest, David Hand for his uh, wonderful talk about that, Sal Kimmick for getting me here, uh, uh, Amanda Brock, Andy Piper, and Aaron Booth for putting this whole event together, both, this, both last year and this year, and of course, my parents, because I owe them everything. So, any questions? <laughs>